Let's get started. Uh, hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's Candidates Forum. It features five candidates for Santa Clara County Board of Supervisor District 5. My name is Eileen Kayo, the current president of the League of Women Voters of Southwest Santa Clara Valley, which covers Campbell, Las Gatos, Mountain Sereno, and Saratoga. The five candidates running for the District 5 seat are in alphabetic order, Margaret Abe Koga, Barry Chen, Peter Fung, Sally Lieber, Sandy Sands, uh, our voter service team members, Eleanor Eek, Sophia Gao, Tom Pickerox, Amy Cody, Francis Zhang, and myself uh, are our team that put this uh, forum together. Thank you. The League is a grassroots organization. So when you sign up with us, become a member of our local league, you also become a member of our Bay Area League, California League, and National League. And there are five local leagues in Santa Clara counties that covers many cities. Thank you. Now, let me share a little bit of uh, history of League of Women Voters. It started in 1920, uh, about 104 years ago, and by a group of women who fought to get voting rights for women and succeed. Today, voting rights are for all citizens who register to vote. And it is very important to know that the League is a nonpartisan a political organization for women and for men as well. And uh, it, it never, the League never supports or opposes any political party or any candidates. It works in two roles, voter services and action. So the voter service uh, include programs such as a candidates forum, like today's and pros and cons uh, on ballot uh, measurement, which later in this year, we will have a presentation on Proposition 1. And we do voter registration and we support vote411.org. This is a one-stop shopping for all of your uh, voting questions that you can go over there. So now let me, I would like to turn this next. Now I would like to turn the program over to Eleanor Eek, our vice president in charge of voter services. And she's also the moderator for tonight's forum. So Eleanor, please. Thank you. Next slide. Good evening and welcome again. Before we get started, I wanted to highlight a few facts about the upcoming primary. Ballots will be mailed out starting next week by February 5th. Early voting sites will also open on February 5th and ballot drop-off boxes open the next day, February 6th. If you want to track your ballot, go to the Santa Clara County Register of Voters or the two websites listed on the slide. Very important, one very important reminder. Now that most of us vote by mail, it is extremely important that you check how your name is spelled on the ballot that is sent to you and make sure when you sign your name on the return envelope that it matches it. Next slide. As you probably know by now, you can return your ballot in one of three ways. You can use the US mail system, you can use a ballot drop box, or you can go to a vote center. Now, next slide, please. Our candidates tonight are campaigning to become a member of the Santa Clara Board of Supervisors. 
This slide gives you some basic information about the responsibilities of that board. First of all, the Board of Supervisors is a group of five elected officials responsible for overseeing county government. They're tasked with ensuring that public services are provided effectively and efficiently while maintaining fiscal responsibility. The Board of Supervisors addresses some very broad areas and a lot is under each one of these, health and hospital, children, seniors, and families, housing, land use, environment, transportation, public safety and justice, finance and operations. And the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors currently oversees a budget of approximately $11.3 million. Next slide. And now I'd like you to take a look at District 5. As you can see, it is quite large and covers a large geographic area. It has a population of approximately 392,000 people and serves a very diverse set of communities, urban, rural, coastline, mountainous. And of course, when you have many different diverse communities, you have many different diverse needs. And now, Let's introduce our candidates. When I say their name, they will put their camera on so they can be seen. And we will begin with Margaret Abe Koga. Good evening, Margaret. Thank you. Our next candidate, Barry Chang. Mr. Chang, if you would put on your camera, your video. Thank you. Next candidate, Peter Fung. Thank you. Hi, Peter. Next candidate, Sally Lieber. And our last candidate for tonight, Sandy Sands. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for joining us tonight. I want to remind you of some things about our, our forum tonight. The league follows a very defined format at its forums. Tonight, each one of you will make a 90 second opening statement, responding to a question that we've already given you. Next, the candidates will respond to other questions, but in a randomized order. Where do these questions come from? Our question sorters, who are league members, have reviewed questions that were submitted through the registration process and from other sources. They grouped questions by subject matter, and then they selected the questions that they felt were most important to be asked. Each candidate will have 60 seconds to respond to these other questions, unless the moderator says differently. Finally, the candidates will have 90 seconds again to make a closing statement, answering another question that we gave them in advance. And to keep us on time, we have our timekeeper, Tom Pickrow, who will signal each candidate when their time is up. 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and then stop. Tom, would you show what the screen is going to look like? when the candidates are answering, that will show the timer is on. Great, so now the candidate is speaking and then 30 seconds left, 15 seconds left, and then stop. And we do ask you candidates to finish your sentence at that point so that we can move on. I have a few more things to remind you of. As the moderator, I'll enforce the time limits. After the moderator says, thank you, your time is up, please try to wrap up your thought quickly. We do request and we have asked our candidates to not interrupt one another. You will notice that the candidates have brought no prompts into their room. They can have a notepad or a pen to take notes, but they don't have other things with them. And lastly, and probably most importantly, 
the league has requested of all our candidates and they have agreed to abide by the norms of civil discourse, meaning they will listen carefully to all other candidates, they will not interrupt, they will not disagree with what somebody is saying. In particular though, they will refrain from naming or making personal, personal statements about another candidate. So thank you candidates for agreeing to that. And now let's begin our questions. Remember I introduced the candidates in alphabetical order and that's the order that they're going to respond to this opening question. And so we will be, getting, we will be starting with Margaret Abbe Koga, Koga and the question is, and you have 90 seconds to respond, why are you qualified to be elected to serve as the Santa Clara County Supervisor of District 5? Margaret, you're muted right now. Can you Thank hear me? You. Yes. Great. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for this opportunity to chat with all of you. I was born and raised on the peninsula to immigrant parents, uh, working class, and I went to the public schools, K through 12, and then worked my way through college at Harvard University. Upon graduation, I came back and worked for Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, and then I began my elected service on the Santa Clara County Board of Education, and then in, since 2007, have been serving on the Mountain View City Council as the first a Asian American AAPI woman to serve as mayor. My commitment to service builds from my experiences with my immigrant parents who were denied access to health care. As a barrier-breaking woman of color elected in Santa Clara County, as a working mom, small business owner, and a breast cancer survivor. As I was mayor in 2009 during the Great Recession and led the city out of a budget deficit. And as mayor in 2020, I led the city through the COVID-19 pandemic, providing financial assistance to families and small businesses in need. In addition, I serve on a number of regional boards, such as the Valley Transportation Authority, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, Silicon Valley Clean Energy. So I bring to this uh, role my lived experience, my hands-on leadership and policy experience, and a vast network of relationships that I've built over the years, shown by my over 250 uh, endorsers. And I look forward to uh, hopefully getting your support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Mr. Chang? Yes. Um, I, I'm running because I feel there's a lot of work need to be done, especially when the county and the state, especially county facing the uh, deficit, budget deficit situation. Um, they need, need someone can get the job done. And I, I'm the one proving to be the uh, leadership can get the job done. I, I was the mayor of city of Cupertino 2016. And I also serve on the Cupertino, um, you, uh, you know, Cupertino School District for eight years, and served nine years on Cupertino City Council, and I led the group to, to fight against the High Southwest Cement Plant, which is polluting the air and the and the water in our in our area. It took me over twenty years to get it done. Okay, finally, Lehigh announced they're closing their operation for cement production uh, last year. So I feel there's more work need to be done. You know, the traffic congestion in, in this area is really bad and it's getting worse. And you need someone really take action to get it done because the traffic congestion is just waste a lot of energy, a lot of, a lot of time for the, a lot of talent people. And, and then also it's, it's hurting the uh, economic growth for our area. So I feel I'm the one I can get the job done. I will, I will take it. Uh, I will tackle the the problem, the issue head on, and get the move move the Santa Clara to continue to be a prosperous area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chang. And if I could suggest maybe put your screen down just a little bit because at one point we were not seeing your full face. So just put your screen down a little bit. Yes, That's Ray. much better. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Peter Fung. I'm sorry, you're muted. Hold on just one moment. Okay, thank you. Hello there, good evening. 
I'm a physician and healthcare district board director. I'm running for county supervisor to usher in a new era of accountable, innovative, and practical leadership to tackle our community's critical challenges. The long-standing status quo policy have failed us. These have to stop. Instead, I'll bring the much needed common sense solution to our present issues, including homelessness, rising crime, public safety concerns, mental health crisis, broken healthcare system, and budget imbalance. My background in healthcare, combined with years of leadership and board governance experience, equip me uniquely to address these challenges head on. My vision is a county where every individual has a safe shelter called home, have access to quality health care, especially mental health, where everybody feels safe, both at home and on the street. This is my vision for you. I hope I can have your support and your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sally Lieber. Thank you so much, Eleanor, and a huge thanks to the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum and for doing so much in our community. I believe that I am very qualified to serve as a county supervisor uh, because I have very deep experience in this area. I've uh, served as a local city council member, as mayor, as a county commissioner in the state assembly, on a number of regional boards and commissions and currently serve on the State Board of Equalization. I have very deep experience in issues involving uh, social services, foster care, health care, mental health care, child care, and the environment. Some of our most pressing issues that we faced in that we face in Santa Clara County today. I am looking forward to the challenge of working on our budget deficit. I have uh, faced very difficult budget deficits uh, during my time in uh, the State Assembly and in other contexts. And I know that I can serve well and hit the ground running on day one. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now, Sandy Sands. Good evening. Housing is our most fundamental problem that we have. The cost of housing is driving people onto the street and away. We have been trying for years to solve the subs with subsidies, but that's just not enough. We have to follow the law of supply and demand. We have to harness the market to build a lot more housing. I have remodeled and built housing for a living. I have been on the other side of the counter at the city and the county and seen all the hurdles they put in front of you to build. It's no surprise to me that housing prices keep going up. I am a landlord. I've seen tenants pay their rent for years, then lose their job, and it all stops. I put a priority on a stable, nurturing first five years of life because I got to see a child who didn't have the first five, right start to the beginning of life and how that played out and all the challenges it caused for them and their family. And even as an adult, the kind of anxiety they have that keeps them from living the life they deserve. I've been in industry. I understand the power of measuring and tracking results and rewarding those results. I, I, what I bring is not the perspective from inside of government, but from outside of government. I'm passionate about taking away the hurdles, the problems, the bottlenecks, to raise our county to a new level, a, a level that's better than any other county, I want us to be an example of what is possible. And that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, candidates, just to remind you, we will be switching to other questions that require you or give you 60 seconds to respond. And our reliable timer will be giving you the heads up as we reach 30 and 15 and stop. And we will, these will be asked in a randomized order. And actually, Mr. Sands, you're gonna be going first this time. So the first question is, it's kind of a two-part question. What are the key issues for Santa Clara County? And what are your top 
three priorities. So identify the top issues for Santa Clara County, and then what are your personal top three priorities? Mr. Sands. Well, the first one I already mentioned is housing because it plays out in many ways. It, it plays out for the homeless. It plays out for the people who have rent that's a burden that they have they have a hard time raising their kids. The fact we don't have enough housing and the price keeps going up drives so many problems in so many different ways. And then that ties into the homelessness. The homelessness keeps growing. We've spent $17 billion in the state for in the last four years, and it keeps on getting worse. I think we have to go about it a different way. So uh, transportation is intertwined with those. So we, housing and so that would make number three. What I would do about it is approach them differently. I think homelessness is not first about a house. I think it's first about finding out what the problem is for that person, whether it's uh, mental health, addiction, or economic homelessness, and, and approach it differently for each person. Uh, the same goes for, for transportation. We have to come up with a better, th uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Sands. And now, uh, Margaret Abe Koga. Thank you. So the county faces many uh, challenges and I would put uh, homelessness as one of them tied with economic development. Uh, we're in a kind of a, a challenging or uncertain time economically. Uh, public safety, property crime is up and we need to um, ensure safe neighborhoods and safe schools. Uh, and then for me, the most uh, important critical issue is climate change. And that's uh, personal. My daughters remind me, my Gen Z daughters remind me every day how they want a bright future. And I want to make sure that they have that. For the county as a government, um, the challenges there is that there is a structural deficit that's growing and it needs to be addressed uh, immediately or it'll continue to grow. And then there's an issue with staffing. Uh, we've lost a lot of people during the pandemic and we need to have this, uh, the staff, the, the folks to be able to provide the services for our community. Thank you. Mr. Chang, you're next. Sure, thank you. Uh, number one is, in my opinion, it's public health. Um, that's why I've been fighting for against the uh, DI before. As I say earlier, it took more than 20 years to get it done. Mr. Um, Chang, could I interrupt and ask you to put your screen down just a little bit so we can see you better? Okay. That's much better, thank you. Better now? Yes. So public health is number one, public safety also related to, and then number three is uh, traffic congestion. Uh, traffic is getting so bad, it will impair our economic growth and also affect the, uh, the health because people got stuck in the traffic and it, it, you know, wasting the time and then inhale the, the bad air. Um, also the housing, if we don't increase the housing, we will have the homeless problem because it's supply and demand. So that's what I feel the most three most important items. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, Peter Fung. Hi, thank you. Our county is facing a lot of crisis, but to name a few only, the first one, will be housing affordability with the resulting of people unable to afford to buy a home or to rent a home, and therefore the result of homelessness. And despite millions to billions of dollars spent on it, the situation is getting worse. That's the number one problem, not just for Santa Clara County, but for the entire California as well. We have 29% of the homeless population in California. The second major problem is crime and public safety issue. The policy of uh, no bail and uh, arrest and no consequences have to start. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fung. Uh, Sally Lieber. Thank you. Um, well, no surprise. I'm also going to uh, talk about housing. 
uh, the lack of enough affordable housing and the number of families and individuals who are rent burdened. Um, also the large number of uh, families and seniors uh, who are experiencing homelessness in our community. And tied into that is the very high cost of childcare. We have essential workers who are uh, living in their vehicles because they can't afford both rent and childcare. Um, I'd like to see um, more uh, focus on mental health and public health. I think in particular, we need to protect the Prop 63 uh, funds and consider siding with the League of Women Voters and voting against Prop 1 in the upcoming election. Uh, also environment and open space, protecting our green belt areas and making sure that uh, housing development is close to transit. Thank you. And now our next question, and we're actually going to begin with you, Ms. Lieber. You've all mentioned housing and this question asks you to drill down a little bit deeper says all Measure A funds for housing have been committed. What comes next? And how can the county help to develop more affordable housing? Ms. Lieber? Thank you. Well, I, I am a supporter of the nine Bay Area County measure that hopefully is coming forward on the November ballot. I think I was one of the, the very first supporters to sign on. To that, we have to recognize that the Bay Area is one housing and one jobs market. And uh, I think that we have to have the transit to go along with that, to be able to um, travel between counties uh, for both jobs and housing. But it's really going to take uh, all nine Bay Area counties working together to ensure that we have uh, housing that is linked to transit, linked to services. Thank you. Next, uh, Sandy Sands. Yes, housing is the, the most fundamental issue that we have going on. And I guess to repeat myself, I feel that the, the programs that we have have not turned it around. That unless we actually look to, towards supply and demand, release the market, make it easier to build, make it more cohesive for so we can get those thousands of units in. And like when we uh, put a few market subsidies down for, let's say, more affordable, that doesn't do anything for the renters. You need many houses of, of smaller size or housing units of smaller size. And then as Sally mentioned, transportation. Transportation needs high density housing, public transportation is the two are intertwined. So you need to do the planning of putting that high density housing and the public transportation so the two can complement each other and, and not jam up our roads. So that's the, <laughs> unfortunately one minute's a little short, but that's, that's where we start. Thank you. And next, Margaret Abe Koga. Thank you. Measure A, I supported it in 2016, and uh, Mountain View has been able to utilize, utilize quite a few, few of those funds. We have uh, about, I think like it's either eight or nine projects in the works with an MOU with the county to use Measure A funds. So in my 15 years, I'm now going on 16, we will have doubled the number of below market rate units in Mountain View. What comes next? I actually serve on MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission that's melded with the housing, ABAG, the Housing Commission, and uh, I'm on the um, committee that is moving this uh, Bay Area Housing Finance Authority bond measure about, we're looking at $20 billion right now. And I can't say it, how I stand because I'm still on the committee and we're about to vote on the language, but we are crafting something that will be um, looking at pro production and then preservation of existing housing, as well as protection. So those are the three Ps that we'll focus on. At the end of the day, is, that's what we need is more uh, resources and funding to be able to build affordable housing units. Thank you. And Mr. Chang? Yes, uh, the housing has to be built around the, uh, the major uh, corridor. And in my opinion, you know, 50 years ago, when the 
Count Santa Clara County Board decided not to join the bar was that was a major mistake. Okay, so I believe that the bar we need to develop some kind of massive public transit system through the entire Bay Area. So then you can bring in all the housing units nearby the major corridor and then reduce the traffic situation and then increase the more housing unit. And then also work with the developer with the uh, number of affordable housing um, ratio, uh, ask them to increase the ratio for the affordable housing, which will allow the lower, the lower income people to be able to also live in the area because you have to look at also equitable issue now only for the uh, those one can afford a higher housing price. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. And uh, Peter Fung. Yeah, thank you. Our first two uh, panelists have very el elegantly indicated that this is a complicated problem. And just having enough funding is not going to solve the solution. So measure A, in my opinion, has a failing grade. We need to have data-driven policy by smart people and good execution. We need to have coordination between the departments and the community engagement. As Sandy mentioned, we need to have the government to understand that let's be business friendly. Let's roll back some of the straight regulations to allow the construction to occur. And then only with good planning, land use, can we be able to increase and have adequate affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. That was perfect timing. Uh, our next question um, is a little long, so I'll, I'm uh, happy to repeat it as we get through the process if you need me to. And we're going to be beginning with you, Mr. Fung, and you probably see a pattern here emerging with the questions. Okay. Question, the next question is, Proposition 1, which is on the ballot, would allocate money for the state to build mental health treatment facilities for those with mental health and substance use challenges and provide housing for the homeless and veterans. However, it would also reduce county funding for various community-based mental health and intervention programs. Do you support Proposition 1? Why or why not? Mr. Fung? I do. Uh, the, 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 the wise use of funding would be important. And again, we now have a mental health crisis amongst other crises that we are dealing. Uh, we do not have enough facility. We do not have enough uh, uh, mental health caretakers and uh, the most recent news that the Cal Aim has stopped uh, funding uh, for the mental health pro uh, program suggests that we're going to need a lot of funding to get this going. And if we don't have adequate support and wise use of the money, between both the state and the county. We need to collaborate on this effort. It's not just one person does all these complicated issues. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sally Lieber. I, I obviously do not support uh, Prop 1. I oppose Prop 1. And I think we can't solve the mental health care needs that are out there in the community by taking money away from mental health care. And that is why the underlying legislation was opposed by the uh, county behavioral health uh, directors and many others. Uh, there was a, a very comprehensive discussion of uh, the issue on uh, KQED forum the other day. And I would really advise everyone to, to look that up because the issue with what's being proposed in terms of conservatorship of individuals that need help 
is that the services that they would be conserved and required to go to uh, do not actually exist. And that is a, a real problem for the proposed uh, uh, measure that's going to be on the ballot. So I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Mr. Sands? Yeah, it certainly is tempting to support it because it's bringing a bunch of money to mental health. Of course, it's it's the standard thing where you borrow the money and, and they always say you don't raise taxes, but the money has to come from somewhere. But one of some of the other aspects I want to add, you've mentioned that it takes money away from the local counties. It also puts more rules on the local uh, behavioral health. And that is opposite philosophy of what I believe in. I believe the people closest to the problem need to have the most freedom, be empowered the most to do the work. And it actually does just the opposite. So despite the fact that it brings more money to the table, the fact that it takes it away from the county, it puts more constraints on the county, it isn't the right solution. And I don't endorse it. Thank you. And Margaret Abbe-Koga. To get to the end, it's easy to just say, I agree. <laughs> and I do agree with the other panelists and the League of Women Voters. I do not support Prop 1. Um, it isn't necessarily bringing more money. It's actually shifting the funding. And so um, that's the challenge is it might expand the, the uses of that funding. But uh, without more funding, uh, we're just having to make choices again. Um, I agree with that local control is important. And um, taking adding more mandates, uh, unfunded mandates, um, is not what we need to be doing. We need to have uh, more resources, flexibility, and those on the on the ground being able to make decisions. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chang. Yes, uh, I oppose it because it take money away from the county. Like, and then the state putting more mandate. It, it doesn't solve the problem. The problem it has to go down to the the bottom level, not to deal with the problem right there. So even though it looks like it's going to take to get more money, but it's not for the county. So I, I did disagree with it. I, I oppose it. Thank you. And now our next question, and we'll be starting with you, Mr. Chang. The next question sure. is, all of you have mentioned something about the county and the deficit. What ideas do you have to increase revenues or reduce spending to address the anticipated budget gap? To reduce the deficit gap, the budget gap, you have to cut down the position, the unfilled position, you know, so, and then also stop the payment to make the uh, unnecessary uh, spending. Uh, those are not is, is essential is item. You, you got to stop it. You have to stop the uh, spending. And then in the meantime, you try to continue to see if you can foster the uh, business to get more business. So you have more income, more revenue coming in. So that's that, that's a solution in my okay, opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Fung? Oh, I'm sorry, you're muted. So I'm finishing up on my MBA degree. So budget 101 in one minute. First of all, there needs to be community engagement and transparency. So that whatever you do will be supported by your constituents and whatever hard decision you have to make, they would not oppose it. For the expense side, you need to improve the efficiency so as to reduce costs. There may need to be some tough decision or spending cuts and you have to cut down on any waste. Uh, you may have to restructure your debt, cost sharing, with other uh, municipals and also have public and private partnership. The revenue, you may have to get money, more money or grant from the state. You may have to use some of the reserves 
And my thing is, do not increase taxes. We have too much taxes already. Thank you, Mr. Fong. Next, Sally Lieber. Well, um, uh, in large measure, uh, reserves and um, uh, cutting of all vacant positions um, has already gone on uh, through last year's budget. And so there is a restricted set of decisions and solutions that can be used this time uh, around. I think that it's time for some really tough decisions about executive pay and about uh, the contracts with consultants. Um, because if you're looking at, is it better to study an issue or to provide the lifeline services that, that help ameliorate the issue that you're studying? I think it has to go to the lifeline services. There is not a way to ask the um, staff and frontline positions to do more uh, because they're currently really at the breaking point and filling in for the many, many positions that uh, have been cut. Thank you. Sandy Sands. Yeah, when it comes to budget deficits, I, I see two, two pieces of it, the short term and the long term. The short term is working with staff and other people to talk with them and see where, where are the priorities, where are the things that can't be cut, where are the things that can be trimmed. It's a very much an iterative process to do that. Structurally long term, though, I think government runs rather inefficiently. It still has budgets that when when people get the budget at the end of the year, they spend every last penny so they can get it again. I think we need to incentivize uh, performance per dollar, you know, whatever that but, uh, department needs to do and reward them by getting the most done for how much they spend and compare that from year to year and measure that year to year. I, I, I my thing is to bring a different culture that is more focused on results. And part of that is getting the best results for your money. And so that's the long-term solution. And, and that doesn't happen in one year. Thank you. And Margaret Avekoga. As mentioned, I certainly have uh, quite a bit of experience in terms of budget deficits and closing them. And what I have uh, learned and, and practiced is when we need to look at revenue generation. Um, that can be uh, based on cost recovery for services, um, also, I tie uh, economic development into this uh, and because we generate sales and property tax that goes into revenue. Um, we need to try to keep our economy strong uh, during these uncertain times. Uh, in terms of uh, how to, we need to prioritize what are uh, what's what's important and engage the community in that conversation and stakeholders, which is what I did um, at the city and at BTA, and then. Um, we need to uh, look at um, efficiencies. Uh, partnerships are great. I, I actually agree with Sally about contracting out. I looked at the budget. I listened to the budget hearings, and there's actually a lot of con contract out services, and yet we have vacancies. And so I would like to look at how much we can bring in-house into the county so we can fill those positions and then not have to pay for those um, expensive contracts. Thank you. Thank you. And as you know, you're going to be the first uh, person for this next question. And that question is, all of you have mentioned uh, the problem of homelessness that we're facing in California, in Santa Clara County, um, and the money that has been put into it already, and yet we still have the problem. What else should the county do to reduce homelessness? Margaret? Thank you. So uh, again, um, it, over my 15 years on the Mountain View City Council, and then more recently, we've actually tackled homelessness as a city. And what I've learned is that it really ha takes a multi-pronged uh, approach, and we have a full spectrum of services uh, in our city, starting with safe parking lots for vehicle dwellers, transitional housing. We were the first Project Home Key site during the pandemic. Uh, we have um, affordable uh, um, pro uh, housing projects, as I mentioned, and then allowing for market rate development. And we have um, we've been seen as a leader in that. So it's that full uh, continuum of options. 
including wraparound services to meet the individuals where they are and to be able to provide the customized services uh, that they need to be able to uh, move into a, a permanent home. I, I really believe that everyone should have a roof over their heads. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chang? Yes, uh, the homeless problem, we need to provide more temporary housing, smaller unit, because the homeless people, if they don't get themselves cleaned up, they will be hard to get a new job. Um, for the interview. So that's number one, a smaller unit, let them have a place to stay, to clean themselves, to prepare themselves. Number one, the county need to provide some kind of job training program for those homeless people so they can go back to the to the uh, job business. Uh, unless we do this, we are not going to solve the problem. Okay, number three, come back to the housing. Unless we have more affordable housing, if the housing keeps skyrocketing to so high, not many people can afford it, then you will have the homeless problem. So there's a three prong. You have to provide temporary housing to those people and then get them placed to stay to clean themselves. And then they provide a job training and then also provide more affordable housing. Thank you. Mr. Fung? Understandably, those people that have been working on it have failed. Otherwise, the situation has not been gotten worse. So we need new and innovative ideas. Studies show that one third to one half of them, the homeless people, are considered as, quote, gravely disabled, end quote. That means they're not going to be able to take care of themselves despite all kinds of support. So these people should be moved into treatment center where they can be cared for. So you reduce the number by one third to one half already. Then you also need to have good prevention program for people that are on the verge of being homeless. You need to increase affordable housing. And lastly, there need to be a, a whole array whole wrap around supportive services, including job training, mental health treatment, and other health treatment to help the people to get them back on their feet. Thank you. Uh, Sally Lieber. Um, thank you. This is something that I've gone very deep on, have uh, conversations every week with um, people who are actually surviving uh, being unhoused. And some of the things that uh, come up to me are that we need to make each step and each place that people are um, better. I think we should be cleaning up areas of encampments and uh, ticketing contractors who come and dump garbage where there are encampments. Uh, we need to diversify providers. We really only have four providers of homelessness uh, services and housing in Santa Clara County, and it's not enough because out of the four, there's probably about one good one. Uh, transitional housing to permanent housing is not working here because there is no uh, permanent housing for folks to go to, and we can't export them to the Central Valley because there's homelessness there as well. Um, we need to look at family affordability. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Sandy Sands. Yes, homelessness, I, I think we, I, I don't approach it as homelessness first. I approach it as a social problem first. The person who has a mental illness issue and the person who has an addiction issue and the person who's on the street for economics are three different people, need three different solutions from the very first step on, from the very first interaction on. And for the people that are there for economic homelessness, there's a program that needs to work. It's called Section 8. It, it has a horrible long backlist, but that is a program that works. We've had it for decades. And for those people that are missing rent by two or three hundred a month and then they're on the street, that's what's designed to take care of. We got to make sure it does that job. And then the other thing we have to look at is be a little more open minded. 
I know we don't think much of Texas's policies, but since 2012, they've dropped their homelessness 30%. Ours has gone up 40%. People from San Jose and LA have gone there and looked at how they do things. We need to go to other places and look for best practices on how to do this. Thank you very much. Okay, our next question, and we're going to start with us. Uh, Mr. Sands this time. I should know the pattern. I should have picked that up right away. Okay, our next question is pretty broad. What do you think are environmental issues that the county should address? Well, the, the biggest environmental issue we have is climate change. And the issue there is that the county you know, it's not a direct line item for the county, but I think there are things we can do. There's a consortium, the Silicon Valley Clean Energy, that the county played a lead in to try to get clean energy for our, our, uh, our whole area. And I think that mechanism should be expanded to work on dropping the price of electricity. Right now, PG&E is incentivized by their business model only to charge more and charge more and charge more. They have no incentive to drop the price. I think we need to look at that in a fundamental way. I think we need to, whether it's lobbying the state or, or using this group, they should make more money when the price goes down, not when it goes up. We need to align what PG&E is and what we need. If we want to use more electricity, we need to make it cheaper. You know, that will push more use of uh, heat pumps, electric cars, than anything else. Make it the economical choice. Thank you. Margaret Abekoga. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of my priorities, and I've had the opportunity to work on this issue extensively over the last several years. Uh, I serve on Silicon Valley Clean Energy. I actually helped start it by obtaining seed money uh, for the formation of it. And yes, we have been able to lower our GHG emissions for all of the cities that are in our, uh, in our uh, joint powers authority, as well as the county. I, uh, GHG emissions is the, the, the big issue in this area. Uh, I support the county's goal of going to carbon neutral by 2030. It's a big lift, but we really need to do it. I am on the Bay Area Air Quality Management District was proud to vote for the ban of gas uh, appliance replacements by 2029. Again, a big lift, but we really need to think big in this area. Um, so that that would be uh, my what I would like to do at the county is to bring all of the different entities together. There are right now municipal utilities, there's clean energy, and we need to really work collaboratively to move the needle in a significant way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Yeah, the uh, major environmental issue facing Santa Clara County, uh, of course, is climate change. Mm -hmm. And then climate change issue, the number one, in my opinion, in the Santa Clara County is the, the traffic issue, traffic congestion. Unless we build massive public rapid transportation system, we are not going to be able to solve the traffic congestion issue here. And we are not going to be able to solve the uh, public housing, the affordable public housing near my major corridor. So this is the, the system we need to build it right away. And then it has to be focused on it. I have been watching it over the, I did in this area over the past 40 some year, it's it just getting worse. So we have to do it, provide massive rapid public transportation system for this area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fung. Yeah, I want to remind the audience and my esteemed colleagues that we are in a county and our job is to select, finalize the state plans and public uh, laws and orders. We are not going to change the environment of the world. But talking about how can we make our work-life balance better, there's something we need to concentrate on and put priority on. Number one, are we wasting food? How is our water? What's the plastic pollution in the area? What can we do about it? 
What about our natural resources? I mentioned about water. We turn on the tap and uh, there's clean water coming out. We are very fortunate. Let's make sure this continue. So, oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Fung. I'm and not Sally, Fung. Sally Lieber. Thank you. Um, so some of the issues that I think are really important right now for the county is uh, green belt and wildlife corridor preservation, preservation of our open spaces, uh, dealing with bay level rise and groundwater rise that's bringing our groundwater into contact with chemicals like TCE. I think that we need to um, get Silicon Valley Clean Energy and others on board with uh, pushing back at the PUC against net metering rules that uh, have led to an 84% decline in rooftop solar. Uh, we need electrification of buildings and all of our transportation sector. Thank you. Okay, and Ms. Lieber, you're gonna be answering this question first. This is uh, the last of the general questions and then we'll move on to the closing. This is a question I think probably everybody who's listening, I know we have a very large audience tonight, again, in different kinds of areas, urban, rural, coastline, and so on. District five is very large geographically and home to many diverse constituent groups. How will you communicate with and learn about the needs of your various constituent groups? Ms. Lieber. Thank you. I, I think it's really important to get out to where the community is rather than uh, expecting them to come to you. I know that we have many people in this district who live in the hills. They live relatively rurally. Uh, we also have concentrations of population uh, along transit corridors. And we have a lot of diversity in terms of ethnicity and language. And I think it's just really uh, lies in getting to where people are. Um, what I've always found is particularly in getting um, input from parents and from working people, it's really going to the places that it makes it easy for them to give the input to you. So farmers markets, other community gathering places and getting that input in a very uh, user-friendly way. Thank you. Sandy Sands? I think the, the model is pretty standard. I, I would follow Joe Smidian. He was known for getting out in the community and doing pretty much what Sally was saying there, going to where the people are, going to the different farmers markets was one of his favorites. But yeah, you can go up in the hills, you go to visit the cities, you, you let people know ahead of time. So I know for our local state representatives, coffee clutches are very, uh, very popular. The whole point is you, you lower the bar for people to come and meet you. And then the other side is your attitude, how you approach people, that you are open, that you really listen to people, that they feel comfortable talking with you, that you keep an inquisitive mind so that when you hear something that doesn't quite make sense, you, you think about it, you ask, you understand what's going on. So I really think that an attitude and going to the people is what it takes. Thank you. And now, Margaret? I've had the opportunity to serve on the Cities Association of Santa Clara County, which is comprised of a council member from each of the 15 cities. I was president last year of the association, and that's where I've been able to work with colleagues throughout the different cities in the county and really get to hear from them what's going on in their communities. During uh, With the campaign, I started early and I have been walking precincts. I probably walked 100 precincts myself in every, every city in this uh, district and at knocking on doors and talking to folks. I've been to the farmer's markets. Um, when I was mayor, I would, I would have these uh, chat with Mac sessions, M-A-K, Margaret Ali Koga sessions, where I would be at a coffee shop and anybody could come and chat with me. And so it's really about being accessible. I've always said, and I have always met with anyone who wants to meet with me, uh, and I will continue to do that. It's a bigger area, but I really think that I can continue to have that open accessibility that uh, has really been a, a core to my service. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Chang? 
Yes. Um, number one has to be open-minded. I'm always open-minded to all different opinion, different um, different different viewpoint. And then number two, open door policy. Anybody can come in and talk to me. When I was on the city council and also on school board and, and the mayor, um, especially the mayor, um, I opened it up. I talked to the opposition group, which we call Beto Cupertino. They call Beto Cupertino. They are, they are opposing to any development, okay? But I hold many meetings with them. Any meeting they want, I, I, I will meet with them. So even though with hostility situation, I would deal with it. I mean, you know, to a situation, there's a, a Caucasian guy with a PhD degree and wrote, wrote an article on their website, say they want to see my body hanging on the tree and see my body dangling, dangling in, in, with the wind, which is very racially, very bad in this area. And I was surprised. You know, just 2016, a couple of years ago, it still happened here. Okay. So okay, thank you, Mr. Chang. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chang. Sure. And Mr. Fung. I think we live in a beautiful area and we are beautiful people here. And I cannot disagree with most of the panelists of what they say about community engagement and what uh, Joe Simbitian have done such a good job. In addition, I would have town halls on a regular basis. I would try to get survey, but you're right. Talking to them personally, reaching out for them and having a person-to-person -person dialogue would be the best way. And I would not hesitate to spend any of my time to understand what they are feeling, what they have in their heart, what they are worried, and what their top priorities are. This is how I can govern well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fung. And now we're going to move on to your closing statement, which is really the answer to the question that we had given you prior to the forum. Uh, the question is, and I'll repeat it again, what question do you wish we had asked you tonight and why? And I want to remind the candidates, this is an opportunity for you to really speak about something perhaps that you feel passionate about, or it's a very important issue that somehow we didn't get to it tonight, that you want the community to know your opinion about it. So we're going to go in the reverse order from the opening. So we're going to beginning with Mr. Sands. So again, the question is, what question do you wish we had asked you tonight and why? And you have 90 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So the I, I guess what I'm bringing to the table here that's different than the others is that I, I'm coming from not uh, inside of government than outside of government. And I think that w while government seems to always be limited by money. All our programs are underfunded. This is underfunded. And I think we have to go after that in a more fundamental way. I, I actually think how the, how the workings of government works, let, let me use an analogy here. We all drive cars and we don't really care how the engine works until it breaks. And then we really care about how the engine works and we get fixed right away. A lot of the things that government does is sort of boring, like the inside of the engine that we don't care about. But it certainly makes a difference of what we get done and how efficiently it gets done and how much of it we can get done. So I really want to drill down on how people are incentivized, how the, the, the whole system is incentivized how we're measuring results, how we're rewarding results, how the people at the top are, how they're being accountable. There are certain policies we have which doesn't encourage accountability. And so my goal is to dig down into some of the, the boring stuff and get more results from government because I think it's really essential for all the important things we've talked about tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sally Lieber. Thank you. Well, it's hard for me to be a, a horn tutor for myself, but one question I think it would be possible to ask is, uh, what are you the most proud of, of what you've done in terms of the public sphere 
in uh, community uh, interactions. Um, for me, it's uh, raising the minimum wage statewide, uh, authoring the uh, California Trafficking Victims Bill of Rights, um, offer, uh, authoring the uh, uh, California uh, Crime Victims Bill of Rights to ensure that the developmentally disabled are treated fair in court. And another big part of things is just all the constituent casework that I've had the opportunity to, to do. A lot of people in the community don't realize that elected officials are like a prepaid warranty. You can make contact with us at any time. My website is a great place to make contact with me and just ask, what should I do about this problem? Where can I go? And whether it's a local, state, uh, county, or federal issue, uh, get advice on which direction to take or a pointer to a community organization uh, that can possibly help. And I'm always very moved by the trust that constituents um, put in us and um, by the opportunity to do good things for people. So I think that's why we're each running and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. Mr. Fung? Hi. The question or the statement you did not mention was that more than 50% of the $11.3 billion budget of the county is spent on the healthcare system. So what do you get for almost $6 billion? You have a broken healthcare system where there are long waiting lines, both to see a person, to have a testing, and frequently the machines are broken. The physicians are discontent because they're overworked, they are understaffed, they don't have the enough support. The facilities are running down. And as I mentioned, we don't have enough mental health facility. And, and Proposition 1 will give us the money to build the facility and to support the mental health uh, persons. In 10 years of El Camino Health, I was able to balance the budget at the same time provide the top left, a uh, top lot exceptional care and even with a profit. And as I look around, I don't see any healthcare personnel, not even on the present uh, supervisor board. I, I wish we have such an experience. It does not have to be me, but it can be me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Fung. Uh, Mr. Chang? I think one of the questions I was- If you would put your screen down a little bit, Mr. Chang, we could see you better. Okay, is it better now? No, a little bit more. Thank you, right? Don't let it go down again. There you go. All okay. right. Um, keep moving. Okay. I think one question you did not ask is, out of five of us, why you think you're the best candidate for the job? And I was surprised that you guys did not ask because I feel I'm the best qualified candidate for the job because I can get the job done. I'm the doer. I get the job done, even though with a lot of difficulty. Okay. For example, the ice cement issue is polluting the air for years, decades. And you know, how many public health, public safety issue. None of the elected official at the time when I started want to tackle it, but I did, and I got it done. And then now, our county is still facing a lot of issue: the traffic congestion issue, the mental health issue, the homeless issue, and the budget deficit issue. So this county at this point of time needs someone know how to do it to get the job done, and then is willing to do it with the courage you know in my situation as i mentioned i even facing someone told me that you would want to see my body hanging on the tree and then see my body dangling in the wind i, I don't it doesn't bother me okay 
because when we need to get the job done, we need to get the job done. So you need to some have someone the leadership with the courage and with the open minded will take everything, you know, get it, all the input and then get do the right decision for all of us. And then this is time we need someone, and I, I I'm I'm the one can do the job. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now Margaret Abe Koga will answer that question for us. And so the last uh, one, two of the others have asked the questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, one was accomplishments, and then the other one um, was uh, what distinguishes me. And I also focus on, try to do both, but um, I believe that what I bring to the table is, uh, one, my experience, uh, 16 years on, in, on the city council, uh, I, I know how to hunker down and get things done. I've learned the inside, how things work. Yes, it's great to be an outsider, but you really need to know how things work. And I've learned how, to, how things work and, and have been able to accomplish a lot for our city, uh, for our region. Um, I've been innovative and that's something that you don't hear in government all the time, but I've introduced and got, uh, we have going on a guaranteed basic income program, for instance, in the city, helping uh, low income families with $500 a month in financial aid. I helped start Silicon Valley Clean Energy. I led the effort for reach codes to have all the cities adopt some reach code codes. And in Mountain View, I led the effort to require all electric new buildings. I'm a fighter. And we didn't talk about transportation, another area I like to talk about, but I, I have been fighting to make sure that our county gets our fair, fair share of funding from the region. I was able to get $28 million for VTA to address the shooting tragedy that we had two years ago. I will fight for this district and um, I will and make sure that we get uh, for our community what we deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And candidates, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight, giving up your time. Uh, it's a very important race. I think we have a strong slate of candidates here. Uh, and you're going to stay on the screen for just a few minutes. And then when I turn it over to our president again, then you're kind of going to disappear. So if you want to wave goodbye now, uh, that might be good. But I want to close by saying, as our voter service director, um, this forum has been designed to impart information to you, the voter, those of you who are listening, in accordance with our belief at the League of Women Voters that a democratic government depends upon informed and active participation of citizens. We hope that the insights that you have gained tonight from listening to all of the candidates will aid you in making your decisions. For more voter information, please visit vote411.org, that website and other sites. Now we'll be leaving you and we'll be listing those other sites that are available for voters. Uh, these sites are available for you to go in and to find out nonpartisan election information. But the most important thing is please vote on March 5th or sooner and help make our democracy work. Thank you. And now back to our president, Eileen Cow. Eileen? Hello. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you again, candidates, for your participation tonight. We wish you each good luck in your campaign. Uh, thank you also to the audience for joining us tonight. So before we leave, uh, I would like to highlight some of the programs uh, that uh, about artificial intelligence that our league is offering in February. Uh, there are three sessions uh, on different aspects of AI. The first one is what is AI and how it could put election and the democracy at risk. It will be held uh, February 7th, that's a Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, through Zoom. And the second uh, session is the impact of AI and misinformation on voting. And what can we do about it? And again, that's on Saturday, February 17th, 10 o'clock. Uh, the last session is on February 28th, uh, Wednesday, and also a, uh, a Zoom uh, at seven. It's AI and public policy. So uh, we look forward to learning all of this different aspect that with you all. And in closing, next slide. Please remember, 
democracy is not a spectator sport. And your vote is your voice. So please remember to vote on or before March 5th. Thank you and a good night. Thank you.